Good afternoon and welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today. This is an NJDEP Bureau of Pesticide Control neonicotinoid focus group meeting. Um, we conducted our rules stakeholder meeting back on September 27th of 2023. And we wanted to follow up and hear more from interested parties after receiving feedback from some of the stakeholders specific to neonicotinoids. Now, neonicotinoids are being eliminated from most non-agricultural uses for the protection of pollinators. We'd like everyone to be aware that this meeting is for informational gathering purposes only both from and to the regulated community and interested environmental representatives as the neonicotinoid rule is a legislative mandate. I'd like to start by introducing the Bureau staff assisting today. John Oreck, our former Bureau Chief who served as such for 22 years is our presentation host. Inspector Spencer Kirkhoff and Laboratory Manager Ann Alliger are helping out behind the scenes and I'm Mike McConville. I'm the present Bureau Chief for the Bureau of Pesticide Control. Um, before we go any further, I'd like to give kudos to John Oreck for coordinating and setting up this presentation and meeting. I am most grateful for all of his effort and hard work on this. And with that said, and no further ado, let me turn the reins over to John Oreck for his initial remarks and his actual presentation. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Oreck. Um, some of you may remember me from September's uh, broad uh, stakeholder meeting that we held. Uh, I'm managing the rule, as as Mike said. Um, I, I do want to make uh, everyone aware that the meeting is being recorded, and we hope to make the um, transcript and live recording available within the next day or so. Um, and make that widely available to everyone who would who uh, would like to review it, or for people who uh, maybe missed the meeting. Um, so a few uh, housekeeping items I'd like to go through first. Um, uh, this meeting is designed as a, a focus group to uh, narrowly hone in on the issues we were facing at hand with the 2024 season coming up, and uh, a neonicotinoid restriction statute in place. Uh, that restriction is in place even without the department concluding rules uh, on this topic, and that's why uh, uh, you know the urgency, so to speak, of this meeting. Um, you know, we'd like an active give and take, uh, active participation, and to that end, we have uh, a couple of options. There's the hand raising, um, if you would like to speak uh, or uh, be seen or both on camera, then you can raise your hand. Uh, there's also a chat function. What I'd like to do is um, at the end maybe of each slide that I present, and there's not many slides, I'd like to open the floor up and we'll see if there are any raised hands. And after uh, we go there, we'll look at the chat to see if there are any issues we've missed and address those. Um, uh, I would ask that you uh, be concise. You know, we do have a number of participants and limited time. so. Uh, please uh, identify uh, yourself and your organization when you uh, give remarks. Um, also, uh, and this may be particular for folks who are calling in, that um, if you do participate in the chat, uh, that you could identify your name and organization in that, since uh, it may just reveal a phone number in, in those cases. Um, so, you know, with that, I, I'm going to pull up the uh, the slides that we'd like to go over during uh, the meeting and um, and start from there.
So there's our first slide um, uh, included there, and, and I'm not sure uh, how well uh, the font appears out there, but you know, it includes my email address also. If anyone has any uh, thoughts after the meeting, questions, concerns, uh, please email me, and that's at john, J-O-H-N dot oric, O-R-R-O-K, at D-E-P dot N-J dot gov. Uh, and anyone who received an invite will should have my email um, from the invite as well. Um, you know, first, I would like to introduce uh, organizations that are participating just to give everyone uh, an idea of who's here or who's been invited um, from the environmental groups. We have uh, Clean Water Action, New Jersey Environmental Federation, New Jersey Conservation Foundation, Environment New Jersey, New Jersey League of Conservation Voters, the Watershed Institute, Araraton Headwaters, and the Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions. Uh, from industry side, we have uh, uh, several organizations and also uh, companies uh, involved and invited in today's call. That's uh, the Green Industry Council, RISE, which is Responsible Industry for Sound Environment, New Jersey Nursery and Landscape Association, New Jersey Chapter of Arborist Society, Chemistry Council, New Jersey Pest Management Association, Golf Course Superintendents, Association of Professional Landscapers, Bartlett Tree Experts, Lawn Doctor, New Jersey Turfgrass Association, and also True Green. There were also some other um, invitees that weren't included in the initial invitation that went out, and, and New Jersey Sierra Club is one of them. Um, so I do want to mention that. Um, so let's get to the purpose of the meeting. Um, we want to share uh, the department thoughts on the intent of the neonic statute, and we also want to hear your thoughts uh, on impacts of the law, situations the DEP should be aware of uh, going forward. And um, what we hope to get out of this meeting, the result for today is a clearer picture of what the 2024 application season will look like. We need that since we know the law as of last October is in full uh, effect. So regardless of uh, the absence of rules, we do have the statute on the books that needs to uh, be enforced. So, so while we'll get a clearer picture after this meeting, it will not be the clearest picture. That will come following the meeting when we have internal discussions based on this meeting today and consult with our advisors under the statute, which are Rutgers and the New Jersey Department of Agriculture, and then issue guidance that should guide uh, the application season for this year. Um, I, I do wanna make a note also that there are uh, multiple levels of legal review. So we as regulators, uh, and me in particular drafting this rule, uh, you know, there are uh, several legal reviews within DEP. There's legal review at the attorney general's office and there's legal review at the governor's office. So um, if we are off track or not on target with the letter or intent of the law, so we will we'll hear about that as we draft the rule. So at this point, before I get into a description of the law, and the Department of Agriculture Authority. Um, if there are any questions thus far, um, you know, we'd be glad to glad to take them. And if not, we will we will move along. Um, you know, I don't plan on reading uh, the fine print or 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 every line of the law, but I did want to key in on a few things. And one of them is that the law did define you know, what a neonicotinoid pesticide is, and it was the the nine active ingredients named in the definition. So there, you know, they are um, precisely named. So we know what active ingredients we're dealing with. The um, 
the other thing is it does define environmental emergency, and I do have that in a, a slide later. So if there's a need to go over the finer points of that definition, we can we can certainly do that. Um, you know, the, the first main part of the law, and, and probably a lot of you have gotten a chance to look at this. The first part is about making neonicotinoids restricted use. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that part because the essence of that part is that the question of whether they're going to be available to people without a license. So in general, it makes them all restricted use. Um, and that means that they should not be available widely at your big box stores or retail centers um, in the future. The main um, part, what I call the, the heart of this law, I think is the second part that does a few things. It set um, the, a deadline of October 31st to limit outdoor applications of neonicotinoids uh, to commercial application uh, only on uh, agricultural operations. So the exception there that would allow non-agricultural applications, um, you know, would be for environmental emergencies. So, um, so what are the conditions that would allow a, a neonicotinoid use outside of agriculture in the future? The first hurdle to clear is that there be a valid emergency. Um, you know, the second is that the neonicotinoid would be effective in controlling the pest involved in the emergency. And the third, no other less harmful pesticide or practice would be effective. So um, as a result of those, there would be an analysis by DEP in um, conjunction with Rutgers and the Department of Ag to conclude whether there is or is not an emergency. If there is, the department would issue an order uh, describing the conditions and any parameters uh, and time limits or geography, what have you, that would be involved in the emergency. Um, so, so that kind of is in a nutshell uh, the department's authority. Now, there's been a long-standing uh, practice and authority also in the New Jersey Department of Agriculture to deal with pest threats. So what happens when there's an identified uh, threat? And, and the wording is very similar to, to what appears in, in our statute, where there's an imminent peril, high degree of risk or harm to health, the environment, um, you know, that can trigger one of these pest emergencies. And the New Jersey Department of Agriculture and the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture work in concert on these um, pest threats. Uh, and, and I don't know the New Jersey Department of Ag process intimately. Um, you know, we, we do have invited guests from agriculture on. So if I misspeak or, or there's some clarification needed, uh, feel free to jump in and, um, and clarify. So, so once a pest threat has been identified, the New Jersey Department of Agriculture drafts an emergency rule to trigger certain powers, and among them, the ability to enter private property in New Jersey to control this pest, and that's without consent. So this acknowledges uh, a pretty severe threat to health or the environment in New Jersey, and, and that's where that um, increased power uh, to enter private property will uh, help greatly in controlling a pest threat. So you can see um, here it's the ag process is a legal imperative. Uh, it sounds like to go out and sometimes uh, the goal is to eradicate completely a pest. Uh, you may remember the uh, Asian longhorn beetle uh, a number of years back, and that was the goal there, complete eradication, not control. Um, a very serious threat to all the hardwoods um, in the state and elsewhere. Um, and when this uh, pest threat is declared and an emergency rule is done by the Department of Ag, um, uh, that fits within the framework set up by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, where there are certain protocols that must be followed. And there's often 
um, funding, pass through money that can come to the Department of Ag to be passed on to counties or uh, possibly municipalities, um, you know, to enlist applicators and and um, and join the fight, so to speak, in in controlling or eradicating this pest. So, so you can see the contrast uh, right off the bat. I think that that the Department of Agriculture essentially has a mandate to do this. Now, the DE process, uh, the department's process to authorize uh, an emergency and sign an order. Essentially, what that would do is allow the voluntary use of neonicotinoids in certain circumstances. It's not a mandate. Um, so these processes are very different, but we'll get into a little bit more uh, later what the possible um, relationship between these two processes uh, could be. Um, so before I move on, um, if there are any questions, uh, or hands to be raised, and I think there is, um, there may be uh, people who want to speak. Um, you, you, you know, we will give mic and camera access for the people who want to speak, and you may have to, on your end, also actively turn on your uh, device capabilities to be heard and seen. So just keep that in mind. Um, so, uh, you know, first we'll see if hands are raised, and then we'll we'll go to the chat. Yes, there is a question in the chat posted from Wayne Dubin. John, how will the industry handle the treatment of large hemlocks and or hemlocks near bodies of water regarding hemlock, woolly, adelgid, adelgid yes. or elongate hemlock so, scale? These so are both invasive pests and we don't have another tool to control this problem, which will lead to the death of hemlocks, a serious force. So health issue. So that's one example that's going into this large, um, I would say, basket of requests. Um, as a result of this meeting and hearing from you, we are going to have internal discussions here and also with Rutgers and the Department of Agriculture um, to analyze each pest situation and whether it rises to the level of an emergency. So that's the first hurdle to clear. Um, so, um, that's what we'll be discussing. I, I, I do want to make mention that we have received several, um, letters from organizations and, um, industry representatives listing a variety of pest situations, including woolly adelgid, um, and, and, uh, perhaps three dozen other pest situations that people would, would like to be able to continue using nicotinoids on. Um, that will all be decided in the coming um, in the coming weeks. I know the season is nearly upon us, and we need to answer that quickly. So I cannot give a specific date, but anyone listening here or tuning in, feel free to give a date by which you think it becomes critical to know. But we do want to get this um, these answers out as soon as possible. So um, the woolly adelgid is one of those several dozen um, pests that we've um, been been asked to consider. So um, it will it will be considered. I don't have an answer right now, but we have the issue in front of us. There's a hand raised from Mark Ware. I'm going to give him access to the camera. And like... Hey, good afternoon, John. I had a question regarding that list. Is there any way, are we going to address that list and what other uh, pests are on that list? Are we going to be able to see that to review it? Um, I, I do have, I believe I have a copy here. I mean, we can make the list public as well. Um, I mean, just briefly uh, going through, uh, you know, I do want to preface it by saying it's a pretty ambitious list. So, um, but these are the pest situations that that we have uh, been uh, asked to uh, analyze and address. So, um, so far we've got spotted lanternfly, emerald ash borer, Japanese beetle, 
um, several uh, white grub species, um, aphids, leaf hoppers, leaf miners, mealybugs, scale, white flies, um, glassy wing sharpshooter, silver leaf white fly. Um, ants in fine turf. Then um, just going through some materials and, you know, when we come out with guidance, you know, we will address all of these as well, but just to give you an idea of the kinds of requests we've gotten. Um, Asian longhorn beetle, emerald ash borer, hemily, yeah, the woolly adelgid, elongate hemlock, elongate scale, Japanese cedar longhorn beetle, bronze birch borer, um, a number of a boxwood leaf miner, boxwood psyllid, Japanese, oh, Japanese beetle again, linden aphid, crepe myrtle bark scale, European fruit lacanium scale, white peach scale, white prunicola scale, eastern spruce gall adelgid, tulip tree aphid, um, and, and there may be a couple more that I received uh, by emails as well. So you, you can see there's a pretty comprehensive list that that we've been asked to review. Um, but I, I, I will say this just um, as a thread of logic to keep in mind. I understand that that many um, for many pest situations, neonicotinoids are your go to tool, effective, economical, um, long lasting. But that effectiveness doesn't make the pest an emergency necessarily. I just want to just throw that thread of logic out there that the first threshold to clear is do we have an emergency? Um, so, so I hope that gives you a clearer picture of what we've gotten so far. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mark. All right, there's a follow up question from Marnie Stopper. Hi, John. Hi, John. In general, when emergencies arise, how long will it take for the NJDEP, Department of Ag, and Rutgers to decide and agree there is an emergency? Then how long until it's communicated? What does this process look like in terms of timelines? Well, I, I think, in, you know, we, we don't have a precise timeline, but I think the timeline's going to be half it'll have to be as fast as the situation dictates. I, I, I know that's that's not a precise answer, but I know with, with Department of Agriculture process, and agriculture, please jump in if, if I misspeak here, but from earlier meetings with the Department of Ag, um, you know, they can put together an emergency rule within a week, um, and things can happen pretty quickly. So. Um, I, I and you know just thinking that at the very least a DEP emergency could complement um, also a, a a Department of Ag emergency that we would have the ability to put it together as quickly also um, so we we would be committed to to doing it as quickly as needed. Um, and that's at, and without a precise date, uh, that's the best I could say at this point. There's uh, another follow up question from Wayne Doodle. John. Well, um, I, I, the first hurdle we would still need to clear um, for 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 this uh, situation, if there's no effective alternative, it still needs to be an emergency first. So that's the first hurdle. If um, if we're talking about, um, we'd have to analyze the situation. If there's absolutely zero um, alternative products. That certainly goes into um, the thought process when we're trying to determine if there's an emergency. 
Um, it doesn't guarantee, I, I don't think, an emergency, but it, it's certainly an important part. Does under the fourth reprint of S one O one six two dot C three, it says both a one foot and seven foot perimeter band around the structure is exempt, but not on plant support. This doesn't include the extension provision. Can you please clarify which swath width was finally approved? It's a bit confusing. Yes, yeah, yeah. So um and this is uh you know related to the structural band treatments um, that without applying to plants, you know, there there was a um, provision for allowing structural band treatments to manage um, structural pests. Um, so, Yes. So, so the first provision um, was, you know, exempts from needing any kind of emergency exemption. So it, it's normal part of business is the application by licensed applicators of a neonicotinoid pesticide within one foot of a building foundation perimeter to manage structural pests, provided it is not applied on any plant. And then a little further down, it said that may be extended by an additional four feet if such additional area is necessary to treat the source of the infestation. So there you have a total of five feet if necessary in the final statute. Follow-up question, does New Jersey use a tier system for invasive species like New York? Well, we don't have a, a, a tier system there was no tier system in in the statute mentioned um i know new york recently uh passed a statute i haven't uh, digested it in full to understand the implications so um you know but certainly if there's anything other states are doing that can inform rulemaking and uh, it's within the authority of of the statute we have to use it you know we will uh, certainly take a look at that All right, so um, I think we'll move to the the next slide. Um, so clearly, the authority that DEP has, as compared to the New Jersey Department of Agriculture Authority, they're clearly separate and distinct. Um, so thus, you know, there could be a DEP declared emergency absent a Department of Agriculture emergency. That could very well be. We'll talk a little bit uh, more about that. Um, but on, on the other hand, you know, it could be seen that the authority for DEP to declare an emergency could be uh, a supplement or complementary to an emergency a rule being done by the Department of Ag. Um, you know, Asian longhorn beetle, case in point, uh, could be a good example where that might fit neatly. Um, um, uh, emerald ash borer, you know, that was one of the pests on the list. That's certainly part of the discussion um, in whether we want to have an emergency regarding that. Uh, you know, I don't know the state of ash trees in New Jersey now. I know in my neighborhood there aren't any left. Uh, I've had to cut a number down myself. Um, if anyone in the um, Arborist industry uh, cares to, um, you know, educate us on on that. That would be um, a very helpful as well. Um, so there could be cases where the department declares an emergency and Department of Ag uh, does not. Um, All right, so I'm going to move on if there are no uh, questions on, on that segment, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, emergencies, uh, current pest situations, um, and maybe some common alternatives um, uh, to the neonics in use now. 
Um, I, I think an objective reading of the law would tell you that they don't, the legislature did not intend for uh, neonicotinoid use outside of agriculture to be a common event. Um, I think there are pests on the horizon that agriculture is keeping an eye on. Um, with with climate conditions being what they are, there are uh, pests, I think, making their way towards New Jersey, uh, maybe here in small numbers already. Uh, some of these are the box tree moth, I understand, southern pine beetle. Um, um, and and I'm sure there are others uh, that we're keeping an eye on as well. Um, so I did mention the the lists that we were sent uh, by various organizations that that uh, making a pitch for an emergency use of neonicotinoids. We will consider every single one of those in our discussions with the Department of Agriculture and Rutgers, and we will issue written guidance uh, as a result. Um, but you know, I I did want to hear a little bit from industry reps and people more expert in these areas than us rule writers uh, on what alternatives that you see yourselves um, using uh, in the future if neonicotinoids are are pretty rarely used. Um, I know there's a few actives out there that I've heard about. Um, amamectin, benzoate, acephate, you know, is sometimes um, used in place of uh, the neonic, neonics. So uh, if anyone has any comments on what they see uh, as plan B for some of these pest situations, if they can't use neonics, that would be, that would be nice to hear. I think we're going to go to, uh, I think we have one question regarding this in the chat well, uh, or. Regarding the Department of Ag and the DP agreeing on an emergency, uh, an environmental emergency. Do you have time for that now? Or? Yeah, no, sure. This I, I think we're getting to the what the process may be or look like between us and Ag. Well, you know. It, this. The, D, the the Department of Ag declares an emergency and without the DEP agreeing, <laughs> what would occur? Oh, you know, certainly um, the two authorities are separate and and distinct. Um, with the neonic statute, the DEP is charged with the Department of Agriculture and Rutgers are advisors to the department. And the ultimate call of a DEP related emergency is the commissioner of the department or a delegated um, manager that the commissioner delegates that authority to. We have no say in uh, Department of Agriculture emergencies. That is a US Department of Ag and New Jersey Department of Ag um, process. Uh, and, and it really does not uh get influenced by the statute we're talking about here in DEP. And just just to to um expound a little bit also upon that, um we would not question um any kind of emergency but declared by the New Jersey Department of Agriculture. That's 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 that would not be our role at all in that. Um, Mark Ware raised his hand. I think we have a question. I think we're going to a raised hand. Um, yeah. Hey, hey, John, it's me again. I'm, uh, um, Sorry, I had uh, for this slide, I had two things I wanted to just kind of uh, address. Number mm -hmm. one being that 
some of the altern there are some some really good alternatives to neo Knicks, but there are certainly uh, no one to one replacements. And my concern is that a lot of the alternative products are can be equally, if not more, uh, impactful negatively to mm -hmm. pollinators as well as even potentially to human health because we're going to be using broad spectrum um, foliar applied products, meaning spraying you know, large trees spraying potentially 80 foot in the air, drift concerns, things of that nature. Uh, my second concern is that uh, we wind up dealing with emergencies that may not be considered emergencies now because right. they were prior uh, prior to this controlled effectively using these now banned products. So those are just the two points I wanted to bring up in uh, with this slide. Thank you. Right. No, those are those are good points. And I think, Mark, what what you might be saying, too, is that <clears throat> the alternatives are not necessarily systemic alternatives that could give you maybe a little bit longer lasting control than a contact <clears throat> or surface spray insecticide. That in some situations, um, the remaining um, systemics on the market will not be effective. I think that's what I'm, I'm yes. hearing as part of your, um, that, that in some cases you would have to turn to um, uh, maybe a surface spray contact type of insecticide. Do you, you know, for the audience and maybe as an education, do you, is there an example possibly of a situation like that you could give us? Well, yeah, and I would assert that most of all our, our alternatives are not systemic. There are very few non neonic systemics available to us in the ornamental market, and the few that are available are effective uh, are not not effective on most of what neonics were effective against. If that makes sense, uh, a good example, I think, uh, just to stick with the hemlock Willie Adelgid example. Um, as of right now, there are no systemic alternatives to either dinotefuron or imidacloprid. So we are going to be forced to do foliar sprays for hemlocks. Uh, and, and the concern that was brought up earlier with waterways as well as height of these trees will make it so that there are a lot of cases where that won't be practical. And as a result, we will lose a good amount of our old growth hemlocks uh, that were previously managed using these systemics. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Tim Wally. Hi, this is Tim Waller. Can you hear Hi, me? Tim? Yes, we can. Hey, Thanks, Tim. So uh, I just wanted to expand upon that a little bit further. As far as the question related to alternatives, we're looking at uh, upping the use of organophosphates, which pose some human health issues, in addition to potential other beneficial insect issues. Um, as far as some of the newer chemistries on the market, and this is just for edification for the group, uh, we've Thank got a, another class of chemicals called the diamides. That's a group 28 insecticide uh, that does have some level of systemic activity. Um, but again, I would agree with Mark that that's cer certainly not a one-to-one -one replacement as far as functionality. And then we move towards, uh, if there are not systemic options, we're getting more into pyrethroids, which are very good at killing insects across the board. Um, uh, materials like uh, various carbamates, like, like seven or carbaryl. Um, which all have potential impacts on pollinators. And I, I don't mean to skew any, any of this, but th those are the reality of the materials that we are left with. All right, thank you, Tim. I appreciate that comment. Ben Graziano. Okay. Hi, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have a question. I, I mean, I'm, I'm no expert when it comes to understanding the, the full range of, of these pesticides, but I know that there's been a num there's been a lot of conversation about 
and not just New Jersey, but some of the other states that have passed similar measures about the actual environmental impact of some of the replacements that we're talking about. Does the department feel like they have the discretion to use that as constituting part of the environmental impact when determining whether or not the continued use of a neonic in a restricted use capacity, of course, could be applied to a certain type of infestation? If if a replacement, if the viable replacement causes a greater environmental impact than say the neonic. That that's going to be a question for legal review uh, as we draft this rule, <clears throat> but also I think as we work after this meeting to come up with a written guidance for this season, we will have to address that very question and any others that come up on how much discretion the department has to um, um, you know, to deal with these situations. So, I mean, when I started with the department, it, it was typical for uh, statutes to be written fairly broadly and and the agencies were left to meet with groups uh, from all um, aisles and across the table and to hammer out acceptable a uh, way that this can be put into place. And um, the trend I've seen is that statutes are written more like rules now. So there's a little bit or maybe even a lot of bit um, um, but less discretion in how to interpret a given situation. So I will say that this statute leans more toward being very specific than general. So as we work through it in, in coming up with our guidance for this season, we will look at the wording, we'll talk to our attorneys and we will come up with the best possible um, answer that we can um, um, going forward. And, and right now it's the best I can I can I can tell you. But so thanks, Ben. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. John. Yeah, yes. Hi. Hi, Wayne. How are you? Hey, how are you? Good. Long time no see. It's been quite a while. I'm still here. Yeah. Only part time, but I'm still here. <laughs> God bless. Good for you. Uh, so and this is kind of, you know, this is not intended to be a gotcha question, but it, and maybe you can't answer it. But uh, is it possible for there to be an, an ag emergency exist and not an ornamental for the same pest? Um, I'm I'm not following you. Um, um. So agriculture has an emergency situation regarding a particular pest that has appeared in New Jersey, and you mean? But we uh, don't. But we don't get the. But we don't get the same love on the ornamental side. So let's say, like spotted lanternfly might be a good example where it's uh, impacting. I, I, it's impacting uh, fruit, it's impacting grapes, but it's, uh, you know, the the ornamental side is still in its own category and not not included in that. Um, I don't know if that's the best well, example, but that's one example. Well, and I don't know if this helps, but um, first. Yeah, if it's a, if it's a, a threat, um, well, well, farmers can use what they, you know, what they want on their farms uh, regarding the neonicotinoids um but you know i i think if it's the same pest that um is a severe threat uh to farmers crops they can already use the neonics but if that same pest uh you know is infesting ornamentals um we have to analyze that situation separately from you know, the ag threat and say, what do we have in front of us now? Uh, and, and you can also see how uh, an emergency situation could evolve. When um, the spotted lanternfly first arrived, I'm in Hunterdon, and we were one of the first counties where it appeared. You can see first arrival in many, in many cases of these pests being an emergent situation. We don't know where it's going or how much damage. And as we know with other pests, um, eventually they gain, if it's not eradication, you know, which we've done with the Asian longhorn beetle, 
eventually we could have a situation where the emergency kind of evolves into an endemic, well, here they are now. Now it's a regular control issue. Um, but upon first arrival or outbreak, um, you could see how it could be emergent then, and maybe a year later or two, it's not. Um, it's part of a regular control regimen. So that's that's how I would look at it. So I, I, I don't know if that helps. Um, well, I think that's a good answer. Thank you. I'll stick to it then. Thanks, Wayne. So we'll see if there's, we have any other hands raised, no other hands raised, any chat questions? Um, um, so I, I think, you know, we're at the point where, you know, if we don't have further questions um, and issues to discuss, I think we see the, um, the road before us, at least I see the department's road, is that we need to uh, get together really quickly, go over our uh, meeting transcript, go over the correspondence we have received, uh, get together where, with our advisors uh, under the statute, Rutgers and Department of Agriculture, and come up with guidance for the season. I, I do, uh, I think I mentioned earlier that you know, I hesitate, you know, to 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 put a date on uh, when the guidance will be issued, but I would like to hear possibly from some industry reps on how pressing, like, give me a number of weeks or what have you, where you say, oh, it would be really good to have this guidance by. And I know if you say last month, <laughs> I'll have to apologize because um, um you know, we're not there yet. We can't go back. But um, if anyone has anything to say on how soon it's critical, uh, I know a lot of these um, soil drenches or, you know, what have you come after the leaves are out and maybe more mid spring. Uh, if I'm off on that or there are other situations where you need to use things earlier, it would be good to know that and kind of have a, um, you know, a projected uh, timeline. I think we have a hand on that one. Okay. And this is just uh, Tim Waller speaking. Hi, Tim. Um, just as a consideration um, to be cognizant of um, neonics, depending on which material you're using, it can be 15 days to 30 days to 40 days before um, they're they've moved to the part of the plant that is necessary to be able to control uh, one of these insects. Mm -hmm. So that's just sharing that information. Um, I have, I had a question though, uh, related to say there was an emergency rule set forth. Um, how long would that rule or how long would that um, emergency situation last for? Is that on a per annual issue? Or, or well, yeah, well, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, well, there's there's two processes. So, you know, there's the Department of Ag emergency rule, um, um, and then there's the department declaring an emergency. With the department's uh, rule under the statute, the emergency can last no longer than one year. So, what does that mean? Well, I mean, if you look in practical purposes uh, for the control of the Asian longhorn beetle, that took, what, 10 years probably to eradicate or more from New Jersey. So in that case, um, if we're part of that process, then we would have to re-up that annual order to, you know, since pests do not work on, the cal on a calendar basis, we have to acknowledge that and, um, <clears throat> and re-up the order uh, annually. So... Um, that's what we would need to do. Now, on on the ag side, I can I think their emergency rule will will last as long as they need it to. Um, so um, their protocols, their quarantines are in place. Um, uh, they follow uh, USDA protocols, and they will they will do that as long as they need to. Um, 
So okay. I hope that that clarifies it. I hope that. Thank you. You're welcome. Jeremy Scannell had a question in chat. Okay. Does the term effective only pertain to effectively controlling the insect in question? Or does the idea of cost effective replacement material come into play when determining if there is an alternative product? That, that's that's a good question. Does uh, in in uh, determining an emergency, uh, I think that the gist of the question is, do economics come into play here? Um, whether effectiveness means you have to, you know, make two or three applications of another product or the, the expense of um, of an alternate product. And, you know, the, the quick answer to that is that the statute did not make any mention of economics. So um, it is possible that if if control could be attained with a non neonic with two applications, that is not economical, but it might be the end result rather than neonic use. I know that that uh, and I say maybe. Um, so that may not be a positive development for the industry if possibly slightly less or uh, efficient products are used or more costly, but it really wasn't addressed in the statute. Um, so, um, you know, that's that's what we can say about that. Um, it's unfortunate, but but that's the reality. All right, so we are. Uh, we'll wait a minute. Everyone, further thoughts? I think. Uh, um, ben Graziano. Okay. Just raised and and we will we will not uh, cut the meeting. We will give people a chance to settle with their thoughts and wait a minute or two before we close the meeting. We want uh, anybody uh, who has a thought or wishes to speak the chance. So, um, and I think we do have another. Ben? I, I, I'll be very quick. I'm sorry. I, yeah, sure. no, a... I, um, I don't want to delay the meeting any longer, but I just didn't know if the department would be willing both, you, you know, Department of DEP or AG to sit down and talk with some of the industry folks. Uh, we could come in, we could provide you some more of that information you were seeking in terms of like the alternatives that are available um, and, and, you know, any additional questions you may have. I just didn't know if that was something that the department would want to do besides meeting, obviously, with the other with AG and with Rutgers. Um, but just offering that uh, ourselves okay. and green industry and some of our other folks would be more than happy to come in and meet with the department anytime you well, want. Understood, and we we appreciate that. Uh, most of the time, regulators like myself are not experts in any one thing. We're more generalists. So um, if there's technical uh, issues that need to be tackled, we often do rely on industry and environmental organizations as well. Um, we tap into those all the time for for information and and um, counsel. So uh, we will take that offer under advisement. You know, as we look at the issues from this meeting, and if there's further information, we will uh, reach out to the appropriate organizations and and companies. So thanks. Uh. All right, we will. Um, We'll give it a little bit of time before we close uh, in case anyone a light bulb goes on uh, over anyone's head and wants to jump in. Um, we'll uh, leave it for a minute. Um, I I will say that uh, over the years I've been more comfortable meeting with people in person than in formats like this. So um, maybe in the future a, a hybrid uh, format could be used. I know this is convenient for long distance invitees, but perhaps we could cobble together uh, um, people who are close to Trenton and uh, far distant people in a hybrid uh, type meeting. Um, that would be my preference. So. Um, oh, oh, <laughs> Arnie Stoffer asks, how can we access the video of today? Yes. Um, that could not attend due to COVID. Yes, we hoped to um, post of uh, this video on on the department website under a uh, stakeholder meeting, even though this isn't quite a stakeholder meeting, it's more of a focused group. Um, we do have a, 
uh, stakeholder or public participation page where this meeting was posted as an invite only meeting. Um, we will post the video there um, and if necessary, you know, we can we can send uh, videos out uh, individually to people as well if need be. So look for it within uh, a day or so um, uh, and, and it should be there. All right, well, I, I think uh, that wraps up today's meeting. I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Um, um, thank you, uh, Marnie, um, and all who uh, appeared. Um, um, it's really helpful for the department to hear what's going on out there and the situations that you're facing and um, take that into account when, when we come up with policy. Um, uh, take care, and I look forward to hopefully seeing people uh, in person in the future.